Miles Morales is Spider-Man. That's it, that's the video. Thanks for watching. Oh wait, you want more? All right, then let's back up some. So I loved a lot of things about Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse, but there was one part I didn't so much. And I'm not talking about what's been the primary sticking point for many, the way the films end. No, it's that whole cosmic determinism, and the way this infinity of Spider-People have become the multiversal enforcers of these canon events. I guess it's kind of fun in that wanky, Rick and Morty meta overload way, but I don't love this for a few reasons, so let's get through those real quick. This first one's probably more a matter of personal taste, but it feels conceptually unsatisfying. It's hard to reconcile the conceit of these films, worlds upon worlds of unfettered possibility, with this new fact that actually there are limits. Certain things happen and must happen identically between Pig World, Lego World, and everywhere else. Maybe we're being misled about how the Spider-Verse works, what breaking the canon actually does. Maybe part two will tidy this up some, but for now, I think this is a bit of a cheap move. Also, sidebar, if every universe needs a Spider-Man, that's why Miguel's so peeved with Miles, and that's why Earth-42 is such a mess, how come it's okay for Miguel and all these other full-time time cops to do this instead of, you know, Spider-Manning in their own worlds? Maybe that is a bit of a nitpick, maybe there's an explanation for that I missed, but as things stand, it seems this is another way that this sequel's new elements don't always fit together perfectly. I am gonna expand on what I mean there in a Patreon endnote, since it's sort of extraneous to the rest of this video, so check the pinned comment for a link. No, the biggest reason I feel like this, though, is that there is a way in which this spider society sort of collapses all these Spider-Men down into more colourful TVA agents. Functionally, there's nothing about this whole agency, or really any of the enforcers, that's specific to Spider-Man, or Spider-Man-ness. I don't love this, but I don't think I'm supposed to. Apart from the whole chase sequence, there's really no reason this whole Spider Society faction couldn't have been replaced with your standard issue red shirt functionaries, and in fact, that would almost have been more fitting, because in their quest to preserve the Spider canon, these Spider-Men stop being Spider-Man. Miles becomes an enemy of the Spider Society when they tell him his father is fated to die, and that he's not to intervene. Their reasoning is sound enough, again, there's supposedly some sort of universe-damaging effect caused by tampering with what's meant to happen, and besides, enduring personal tragedy is part of what forges a Spider-Man into the best hero they can be, but this obviously doesn't work for Miles. Earlier in the film, after a little family falling out, Miles storms off. It's his life, he says, but Rio disagrees. It's not all about him. His life is also his mum's, his dad's, his family's, his communities. I'm paraphrasing from memory, but that's the general gist. And while there's a little clingy mum energy to the way Rio says this, she's obviously not wrong. As John Donne wrote, no Spider-Man is an island. I'm paraphrasing from memory there too. Even in these Spider-Verse films, the effects Miles, Gwen, and Peter have on each other, their lives, their heroism, bears this out. It isn't just about his life. How could it be? Something deceptively important happens about midway through the film. Miles alters a canon event in Mumbatan, and the Spider Society dispatches a squad to try and stabilize the damage, which tells us that that's possible. Saving those people who are supposed to die, according to a potentially unreliable narrator, doesn't necessarily doom a world. This changes things. With this in mind, the Spider Society becomes a group all about looking out for Spider-Man. Following the canon, letting all these deaths occur, might teach resilience to the multiverse's arachnid heroes, and it might make the Spider Society's lives easier, but it doesn't appear to be the only way. Salvaging a non-canonical universe doesn't appear to be impossible, just inconvenient and risky. But do you know what else is inconvenient and risky? Being Spider-Man. This is the point, right? This is why we sympathize with Miles. The way that protecting that abstract Spider-Man archetype across the multiverse strips our enforcers of their Spider-Man-ness. Crucially, Miles isn't Spider-Man for Spider-Man's sake, or even for the multiverse's sake. It's not just his life. He's Spider-Man for other people. 
and trying to save other people, even at the cost of multiversal stability, whether they're his own dad or Mumbat and Captain Stacy, staring down that trolley problem and saying, no, I'm saving them all, that is a quintessential Spider-Man move. That is the quintessential Spider-Man move. And Miles makes it when an infinity of Spider-Men do not. And that's neat. Miles Morales is Spider-Man. He has been for over a decade now. But for some reason, not everyone is eager to recognize the truth of that simple statement. It's, it's racism. The reason is racism. They'll add caveat after caveat, or they'll just be direct and say, no, Peter Parker is Spider-Man and Miles Morales is Miles Morales. It won't matter that Tim Drake's Robin, Wally West is The Flash, Sam Alexander is Nova, Miles Morales is different. His character is boiled down to his skin color. Talking about uh, Peter Darker. His very existence supposed to be some woke plot, and that spider mantle is contested. Across the Spider-Verse also sees the validity of Miles' existence, his claim to that mantle questioned, though of course, in a different way. He's labeled an anomaly. His existence is a mistake. He shouldn't be Spider-Man. Someone else should have been Spider-Man instead, he's told. But despite this, he's able to outrun and outsmart the spider society. Despite this, he's the only one of them that aspires to, you know, save the people that need saving. Between this and the trans lighting that illuminates the scene when Gwen comes out as Spider-Woman to her dad, thwarting other people's ideas of who you're supposed to be, of how you're supposed to be you, is, if anything, a theme more present here than in film one you're not supposed to be this, is a sentiment weighing down our protagonists the whole way through. So I don't think the way this echoes all that Miles Morales is Miles Morales discourse is a coincidence. And so bearing this in mind, what do we see in the film? Miles Morales out spider manning everyone else. Across the Spider-Verse is a multifaceted piece, with many points to make, some complex, but undoubtedly, one of them is simply this. Miles Morales is Spider-Man. In an ideal world, I'd be able to leave that point there, but as Madonna said, this is not an ideal world, and I am not an ideal boy. Again, paraphrasing from memory. No, ours is an age of media illiteracy, and as such, I think I'm best to include a preemptive defense slash elaboration. The particular style of analytical gymnastics YouTube chuds like to abuse, a full video on which is coming soon by the way, would surely look at Miles, the newest Spider-Man of color, out spider manning the others, the straight white males, and conclude that this is bad and woke and tokenizing, etc, etc. That this affirmation only works because all those other Spider-Men are acting out of character. That what we're seeing here is actually multiversal character assassination. Spider aside on an interdimensional scale. But here's the thing, it isn't character assassination. Given the information most members of the Spider Society have, their choices do make sense, so long as we keep in mind the different perspectives of these characters. The Spider Society are seeing the Spider-Verse and its rules, are seeing canon from a sort of top-down perspective. Like the well-read viewer, they know these things happen to Spider-Man, and that ultimately he gets through them. The society is led by people who have suffered all these tragedies themselves, that tried to stop them but couldn't. To them, it's probably easier to imagine that these tragedies are utterly inevitable. The leadership knows every Spidey gets through, though. They know about great power, great responsibility, yada yada yada. They know that Spider-Man can't save everyone. These lessons are obvious from a multiverse of data, and so they've set about applying them didactically to every new reality. From their perspective, from the top down, in retrospect, that makes sense. But Miles is seeing all this from the ground level. He's living it for the first time, as far as he's concerned, for the only time. This isn't abstract to him. Whether this happens to other Spideys, whether they come out stronger, that's meaningless. This is his dad's death we're talking about, and all these jabronis are telling him he can't even try to stop it? They all got to try, why shouldn't he? Oh right, yeah, there's a bunch of multi-dimensional weirdos telling him it's fated one minute, then admitting his existence itself is an 
anomaly? Sure, I'd be convinced. Who's to say they're even right? But maybe they are. Maybe there is a trolley problem here. Let his dad die or save him, dooming the world. Maybe his best efforts will be for naught. Maybe there is no way to get that happy ending. But he has to try. He has to fling himself in front of that trolley, shoot some webs, and pull with every fiber of his being. Everyone's choices here make sense. Miles' Spider-Man isn't being artificially affirmed at the expense of anyone else. He proves himself, again. Not that he even needed to. So, you know, if you see anyone trying to make that argument, send them here. In summation, then, I loved a lot of things about Across the Spider-Verse, but what I maybe love most is the way it trashes these narratives, shows again, without a shadow of a doubt, that Miles Morales is Spider-Man, no caveats, no asterisks, that there's a wealth of value in legacy characters, in this character in particular, in seeing this amazing story, this amazing mantle, the powers, the possibilities, the highs, the lows, with fresh eyes, with different eyes, with Miles' eyes, and in seeing him change that story. But, but for real though, why didn't they just call it part one, you know? Thanks for watching. Drop a like, hit subscribe, I'm trying to hit 100k this year, maybe check out the Patreon, maybe leave a little comment, or maybe just sit back and watch as I thank my very generous Patreon supporters, especially Daniel Goldhorn, Heather Long, Ryan Emily, and Weirdy Beardy.